Okay, let's open up to Luke chapter 17. Open your Bibles to Luke chapter 17, please. And let's pray for God's help. Lord, we do pray for your blessing today as we open up your word. Would you give light and give us a heart, Lord, to see what you're saying and want to obey. We pray, Lord, that you'd open our eyes to see the beauty of humility and desire to be humble people before you. In Jesus' name, amen. The Navigators are a Christian organization that were started back in the 1940s by Dawson Trotman. But Dawson Trotman's successor was a man by the name of Lauren Sani. And the Navigators were known for promoting a servant's attitude. So someone once came up to Lauren Sani, a businessman, and he asked him, um, how can I know if I have a servant's heart? And Lauren Sani re replied to him, by how you act when you're treated like one. How can I know if I have a servant's heart? You can know by how you act when you're treated like a servant. So if someone treats you like a servant and you act all offended, that shows that you don't have a servant's heart yet. <laughs> But if you say, you know, I'm being treated better than I deserve because biblically I'm a slave and it's not just that I'm a slave, I'm an unworthy slave according to Jesus Christ. I'm actually being treated better than I deserve and so I'm not going to be offended by this. That's a humble man. That's a man who's learned to have a servant's heart. Robert Schuller once made this statement in his book, Self-Esteem, The New Reformation. He said, sin is any act or thought that robs myself or another human being of his or her self-esteem. Let me say that again. Sin is any act or thought that robs myself or any other human being of his or her self-esteem. Now, I want you to think about that statement. Is that true? Is sin robbing yourself or somebody else of self-esteem? No. Does the Bible say that? Jesus said, if any man will follow me, let him, what? Deny himself. <laughs> Take up his cross and follow me. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, 2, in the last days, difficult times will come. Men will be what? Lovers of self. Lovers of self. Now we're bombarded with this, this uh, message today that we're supposed to love ourselves. We're supposed to esteem ourselves. We're supposed to value ourselves. The scripture says, deny yourself and to list, to, to head the list of all the sins that will be prevalent in the last days, it will be those who love themselves. Now, the, the central idea here in Luke 17, 7 to 10 is that of humility. Jesus is talking to his disciples about cultivating an attitude of humility before him. In fact, I could have entitled this message a biblical perspective of self. Because Jesus in verse 10 tells us how we should view ourselves. So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded you, say, we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. Now, I want you to remember the context. In Luke 17, verses 1 through 10, Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he's just told his disciples that if somebody sins, you are to rebuke him. If he repents, you are to forgive him. And they say, well, Lord, how often do we have to do that? What if he comes back seven times in a single day? Do we still have to forgive him? Jesus says, yes. Even if he comes back seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive him. And at that, they, they say, well, Lord, we, we need you to increase our faith. Because they felt like what Jesus was asking them to do was impossible. And they needed faith to believe that God could empower them and enable them to continually keep on forgiving people that sinned against them. And so Jesus says, well, no, you don't need more faith. Even if you have the tiniest of faith, 
If you exercise that faith, you can do impossible, miraculous, supernatural type things like uprooting mulberry trees and casting them into the sea. You don't need more faith. You need to exercise the faith that you have. And at that point, Jesus knows that they are in danger of pride. Because if they are able, by His grace, to forgive people on an ongoing basis, and if they're able to exercise this faith to see miraculous things done, then that could engender a spirit of pride in themselves, as though they're something special. And so Jesus goes on in verses 7 to 10 to squash that pride and to help them to see that whatever they're able to do for Christ is only because Jesus has empowered them to do it and that doesn't deserve special thanks or praise, the praise and the glory should go to Him rather than to us. So that's the context. Now, all the way through verses 1 to 10, Jesus is really contrasting what He wants His disciples' lives to look like with how the Pharisees were living their lives. He tells them not to put stumbling blocks before these little ones, these young believers, because the Pharisees were doing that, and he didn't want them to live like the Pharisees. Remember how the Pharisees saw these little ones, these tax collectors and harlots and sinners coming to Jesus, and they wanted to keep them away from Jesus. They were putting stumbling blocks in their way. We also find that the Pharisees were not rebuking and restoring and forgiving people who had gone astray. Instead, when they saw sinners, they totally withdrew and held themselves aloof from them. They wanted to be as far and as separate from sinners as they possibly could. And so Jesus teaches his disciples, no, don't do that. When one of your brothers sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. In other words, go out of your way to bring restoration and peace and reconciliation between those who sin against you and yourself. And then finally, the Pharisees were famous for wanting the applause and the attention and the notice of other people because they looked at themselves as very righteous and holy. In fact, in Luke chapter 18, Jesus gave a special parable because the Pharisees were those who looked on themselves as righteous and viewed others with contempt. And so Jesus gives this little story here in verses 7 to 10 to counteract this tendency of the Pharisees to view others with contempt and to hold themselves up as very righteous and special. In fact, in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus uh, lambasts the Pharisees. He, there's a whole chapter devoted to his correction and rebuke of the Pharisees. And he says in Matthew 23, 5, they do all their deeds to be noticed by men. They broaden their phylacteries. A phylactery was a little box that they would carry on their wrist or on their forehead and, in, and, and included these scriptures from the book of Deuteronomy. And they make these big boxes and stick them to their forehead or to their wrist. They broaden them. They lengthen the tassels of their garments to appear holy before other people. They love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by men. You get the, the picture? They loved people to think well of them. And they went out of their way to try to make this impression upon other people. In fact, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, When you give, don't be like the hypocrites, for they like to stand on the synagogue and blow a trumpet when they put money into the temple treasury. Don't be like them. So the Pharisees, whenever they wanted to give, they tried to get as much attention as they could before they dropped their bills or their coins into the treasury. He says, When you pray, don't do it to be noticed by men, but go into your closet where nobody sees you praying except for God. When you fast, don't put on this gloomy face so that everybody knows you're fasting. But fast in secret so that only God and your Heavenly Father knows it. So the Pharisees were going out of their way to do all of these righteous deeds so that men would notice them. And I believe that's why in Luke chapter 17, Jesus takes the time to teach His disciples about humility. They were not to copy and emulate the religious leaders of their day, instead they were to copy and emulate Jesus Christ in a pattern of humility. 
Now, there is a huge danger in pride. In 1 Peter 5.5, 5, the Bible says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to who? The humble. God's opposed to the proud. If there's one thing I don't want, is God to be opposed to me. How about you? You want God to be opposed to you? All you have to do is be a proud person. But He gives His grace to humble people. Over in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16, the Bible says, There are six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven which are an abomination to Him. The very first one, haughty eyes. In other words, a proudful, arrogant person. Haughty eyes. God hates seven things. Seven things are an abomination to Him. The thing that tops the list of things God hates is pride. Haughty eyes. It was pride that got Lucifer kicked out of heaven. In Isaiah 14, he said, I shall be as the Most High God. And God says, no, you won't out with you. <laughs> he was kicked out of heaven to the earth. It was pride that caused Adam and Eve to be kicked out of the Garden of Eden. It was pride that caused them to commit that first sin, which plunged the whole world into ruin and devastation. Now there's a curse upon everything. Because they wanted to be as God, knowing good and evil. In Proverbs 16, verse 5, the Bible says, Everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Assuredly, he will not be unpunished. 16.5. I'll read it again. Everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Do you know what an abomination is? It's that thing which God hates. Basically, God is saying he hates pride. It tops the list of the things that God hates. But not only does God hate pride, He loves humility. And do you know where God sees humility first and foremost? He sees it in the person of His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, I am gentle and humble in heart. Jesus was a humble person, putting others before Himself. The word humility really means lowliness of mind. It's not thinking less of yourself, it's really thinking of yourself less to be a humble person. It's being a selfless individual, putting the needs of others before yourself. So God loves humility. And in order to promote humility, Jesus gave us this little story in Luke chapter 17. And I want you to notice a few things about the story. It consists of three questions. There's a question in verse 7, another question in verse 8, a third question in verse 9, and then in verse 10 there is a summation a climax, and an application. Jesus drives home this little story by applying it to the lives of his disciples by saying, so you too, just like this slave in the story I've just told you, so you too do what I've just outlined. So let's read the story, starting in Luke 17, 7. Which of you having a slave plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he has come in from the field, Come immediately and sit down to eat. But will he not say to him, Prepare something for me to eat, and properly clothe yourself, and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you may eat and drink. He does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded you, say, We are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. <clears throat> Now, this morning, I want to bring out three truths. And these three truths come from the application part of the story, primarily verse 10. Truth number one, we should confess that we're slaves. Because Jesus said, when you've done all the things which you commanded you, say. They're to say something. They're to confess something with their lips. What are they to confess? We are slaves. Truth number two, we should confess that we are unworthy. We are to say we are not just slaves, we are unworthy slaves. 
Point number three, this comes from verse nine, we are to confess that we don't deserve special thanks. He doesn't thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? Implied is, we shouldn't be looking for special thanks when we do all the things that God has commanded us to do, because we're the slave in the story. So let's take a look at the first point. We should confess that we're slaves. Now that comes from verse 10. You too, when you do all the things which are commanded, you say we are unworthy slaves. Have you ever thought about yourself as a slave of God? Is that how you identify yourself? I'm a servant, I'm a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know, Paul saw himself that way. Notice how many of the epistles he starts by saying, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Peter starts his epistles that way. Jude starts his. James starts his. All of the apostles saw themselves as slaves of Jesus. Even the ones that were his half-brothers, like Jude. He had the same father. Excuse me, different father, same mother. So he was, he was a brother of Jesus, but he saw himself as a slave of Jesus Christ. James did the same thing. When Mary, Jesus' mother, was approached by the angel Gabriel in Luke chapter 1, in verse 38 she said, Behold, I am the bond slave of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. So Mary, the mother of Jesus, saw herself as a slave of God. This is the identity of every Christian. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul is writing to the, the church there at Corinth, and in verse 19, he says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. Now if we are not our own, whose are we? Well, of course, we're God's. If we're not our own, why are we God's property? Verse 20, because He bought us. What was the price? The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, His death, His substitutionary death for your sin. By Jesus dying in your place, He bought you purchased you, made you his slave. Now, let's think about slaves, because in our culture we don't have slaves anymore, and that's a good thing. But maybe the, the closest thing we would have to a slave today would be a maid or a servant who is paid. So they're not a slave, because a slave was not paid anything. A maid or a servant, a butler or whatever... He, he's given a paycheck, and he can quit anytime he wants, right? A slave couldn't quit. A slave was paid nothing. A slave had to do whatever his master told him to do. A lot of times in the culture of the first century, when a country or an army would go in and invade another country, and they would win captives, and they had prisoners of war, those prisoners of war would then be auctioned off on a slave block in the middle of the town square, and they'd be auctioned off to the higher bidder, and that highest bidder would take that slave home, they would bore a hole through its ear and put an earring in it, and en engraved on that earring would be the name of the master. So the slave now has lost all individual identity. He's no longer John or Peter or Luke or whatever. Now he's the slave of Mr. Brown. That's who he is from now on. He's lost all his rights, all his freedoms, all of his privileges. He doesn't have any privileges, any freedoms, any rights any longer. If his master tells him to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and begin work, then that's what time he gets up. If his master tells him to get up at 4 a.m., that's the time he gets up and starts work. If his master tells him to get up at midnight and do something for him at midnight, he gets up at midnight because he has no option. <laughs> he has no ability to to rebel. He is the property of another person. He's kind of like an animal, where you can buy an ox or buy a pig. That's how slaves are treated, as a living tool, as the possession of another person. So when the disciples heard Jesus tell this story about a slave who comes in from the field, 
and immediately wants to sit down and eat, they probably laughed out loud because it was ludicrous to them to think of a slave being served before the master. They knew that just would never happen. When the slave came in, he had to wash up. He had to change his clothes and make himself presentable. Then he had to cook his master's meal and serve his master the meal. When the master was done, he would take his dishes and he would clean up the kitchen and all the dishes. And then, at that point, after everything else was done for the day, he could eat the leftovers and go to bed and get up the next day and do it all over. That was what was expected of him. So, oftentimes we're told, Jesus died for you. Jesus rose again for you. And we're told this over and over and over. And as with most partial truths, this contains a kernel of truth to it. Because yes, Jesus did die for you, didn't he? He died for your sins. He did rise for you. But it's only half of the truth. Let me show you this from Romans 14, verse 9. Romans 14, 9. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why did Jesus die and rise again? According to Romans 14, 9, it was so that he would be Lord of all of us slaves. So that he'd be the Lord of the dead and of the living. Or another text that might help here, 2 Corinthians 5, 15. Why did Jesus die and rise again? He died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Why did Jesus die and rise again? According to 2 Corinthians 5.15, it wasn't for you, it was for him. So that you would live not for yourself, but for him who died on your own behalf. So yes, he did die for you, but that was not the only reason he died. He died to become the Lord of all of his slaves, and he died so that you would no longer live for yourself, but for him. Oftentimes we think, oh, I'm saved. That means I'm free, 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 I'm free. Well, that's a partial truth also. We're free from some things, aren't we? We're free from sin, the penalty of sin, the power of sin, Satan's dominion over you. All those are wonderful truths. But Romans 6.18 says, Having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So you're not free of all rule. You're free from Satan's rule, but not all rule. You will never be completely free of all authority or all rule. As Christians, we are subject to the rule and the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, there's two kingdoms. The Bible identifies two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. And Jesus is the king of the kingdom of light. Satan is the king of the kingdom of darkness. And Colossians 1.13 says that we have been rescued from the domain of darkness and have been transferred to the kingdom of God's beloved Son. So it's not that we're free from all kingdoms. The truth is we've been separated and transferred from the old kingdom of death and darkness to this new kingdom of life and light where Jesus rules. So we are born into Satan's kingdom. We're born into the kingdom of darkness. And Satan pretty well will let you do what you want for those who are subjects in his kingdom. When Paul writes to the Ephesians in chapter 2, he says in verse 3, that we formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. So Satan lives you li he lets you live in the lusts of your flesh, he lets you indulge the desires of the flesh and of the mind, it's kind of like being on the Titanic. And the Titanic, of course, was this huge cruise ship that they thought was indestructible, but it hit an iceberg, and it began to fill with water, and it was only a matter of time until it sank. Well, being part of Satan's kingdom is kind of like being on the 
Titanic with Satan as the captain. And the captain comes over the intercom and he says, Ladies and gentlemen, I just want to let you know that all the drinks are on the house today. You can go to the bar and you can have as many alcoholic beverages as you want. And in fact, if you want to play football in the dining room, that's okay with me. If you break a lamp, I don't even care. Just have fun. And so everyone thinks, wow, we've got such a nice captain. He lets us do whatever we want to do. You know why he does that? Because you're going to perish in just a matter of time. And in Satan's kingdom, he lets you do whatever you want because he knows you're about to perish. You're going to be destroyed in just a matter of time. But in the kingdom of Christ, everything's different. He doesn't let you do whatever you want to do. He tells you what he wants you to do, and you're bound to obey him because you're his slave. So our testimony is, before I met Christ, I did what I wanted to do. After I met Christ, now I do what he wants me to do. That should be the testimony of every Christian. If you can't say that, maybe you've never been converted because that's the testimony of a Christian. He goes from doing his own will to doing the will of God. In fact, you remember in Matthew chapter 7 when Jesus is saying, um, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does what? The will of my Father who is in heaven. That, that's uh, Matthew 7, 13 or 14, right in there. So that's the character of a Christian. He is one who seeks to do the will of his Father. Not his own will, not his own fleshly lusts and the desires of his mind and of his, of his flesh, but the will of his Father who is in heaven. A lot of people think, well, a Christian is somebody who doesn't smoke, they don't drink, and they don't cuss. That's a Christian. No, <laughs> that's not a Christian. A Christian is somebody who does what God says, period. And when they don't do it, they mess up, they sin, they repent. They ask for forgiveness, and they ask for the power of the Spirit so they will honor Jesus with their life, and they seek to start over. And as often as they sin, they repent. Their whole life is a, is a life of repentance and a life of seeking to do the will of their Father. Sometimes we, we can kind of have the attitude, you know, well, I put in my eight hours today. I've worked hard, I'm just going to take a shower, have some dinner, and then do what I want the rest of the evening. Maybe I'll watch some TV, maybe I'll watch some YouTube videos, maybe I'll listen to some music, because I'm entitled to some R&R. &R. I know there's a meeting of the church tonight, I know that this is the night we go out and we talk to people about Christ, but I'm not going to do that, I'm just going to do what I want to do. And I think the question that we should ask is, you're entitled to what? You say you're entitled to some R&R? &R? How much is a slave entitled to? Nothing. Nothing. He's entitled to do his master's will. That's all he's entitled to do. Now, it may be the master's will for you to rest and relax, but it might not be. And if it's not, then it's not our prerogative to do whatever we feel like doing. Just like it's not our prerogative to spend our money on whatever we want to spend it on or to use our time to do whatever we feel like using our time for. We're slaves of the Lord Jesus Christ. So really, success in your Christian life consists of this, putting your desires to death and doing the desires of your Father instead. So number one, we should confess that we're slaves. Number two, we should confess that we are unworthy slaves. Unworthy slaves. Now, Jesus uses that word unworthy. If you have a King James, it's the word unprofitable. When we've done everything that we've commanded, we should say we are unprofitable slaves. The word really means being of no use or not able to profit God. We're not able to profit Him. Now, why would it be that we can't profit God? We have nothing to offer. I mean, He has everything. Yeah. He's nothing from us. He's perfect in and of Himself. There's nothing we can do to make Him complete or to add to Him or to enrich Him. He's already 
completely rich, completely complete, perfect in and of himself. He doesn't need us. He's not a debtor to us. So we can't profit God. So we are to confess, I'm only an unprofitable or an unworthy slave. And he says, we are to confess that after we have done everything that he has commanded us. How many of us have done everything that we have been commanded to do? Have you done that? Have you done everything God has commanded you to do? <laughs> Jesus said, even if you were to do everything he commanded you to do, still you were to say, I'm an unworthy slave. That's my self-identification. We've done a lot of things that God has forbidden us to do, let alone not doing everything that he's commanded us to do. So let's say, let's say you did. You did everything God commanded you to do. We could have a graduation ceremony for you and give you a plaque. And on the plaque it would read, unworthy slave. That's what you get. That's who you are. According to Jesus, and I'm not making this stuff up. I'm not trying to put you down. I'm just telling you what Jesus said, right? This is, these are his words. <laughs> I have to say that because it sounds so out of step with everything we hear in our modern culture. But this is what Jesus tells us. So we can't believe the lie that God needs me. Somehow I can enrich God. Somehow I can do something to make God bless me. Somehow I can do something to make God my debtor. I can't do any of those things. See, we can never put God in our debt. God is the fountain. And we are the guys that walk to the top of the hill with our little tin cups, put them in the fountain, and take a drink. But God is the giver. He keeps giving. He keeps flowing. The water just keeps rushing out. We don't have our little... It's not like we come with our little tin cup and we think, I'll pour some water over the fountain to add to the fountain. It's ridiculous. God is the great giver. Romans 11, verse 35 and 36. Or who has first given to God that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. There's the question. Who has ever first given to God that it would be paid back? In other words, who has ever put God in his debt? What's the implied answer? Nobody. <laughs> Nobody's ever been able to do that, including you and me. We have never put God in our debt. So we have not done all that God has commanded. It ought to fill us with shame, a sense of shame that we haven't done all that he's commanded, and a sense of unworthiness, We've sent away any rights that we may have had in a perfect state. It makes me think of famous preachers who sometimes are introduced when you go to a conference or you watch Christian TV and they introduce these famous preachers, the organs playing and the spotlights on them and they say, now the great servant of God, Mr. So-and-so. Well, we should say, now unworthy slave, so-and-so. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Because if they're great, they're not a slave. And if they're slave, they're not great. You can't, it's like, you can't put those words together. How did Paul look at himself? It's interesting, when you look at the Apostle Paul, when he started out in his ministry, he called himself the least of all the apostles. 1 Corinthians 15. Later on in his ministry, he called himself the least of all the saints in Ephesians. But at the very end of his life, in 2 Timothy, he called himself the chief of sinners. You see his downward estimation of himself? Least of the apostles, least of the saints, now he's the foremost of sinners. So he kept growing in this humility the longer he knew Christ. What did uh, Isaiah say about himself in Isaiah 6? Woe is me, I am ruined, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst a people of unclean lips. He said, I'm ruined. Cursed am I. Woe to me. Because of my... <laughs> when I compare myself with God and His holiness, I'm undone. So not only are we slaves, according to Jesus, we're unworthy slaves, and that should be our confession. 
But number three, we should confess not only that we're slaves, not only that we're unworthy slaves, but we're unworthy slaves that do not deserve special thanks. Look at verse 9. The master does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? Of course not. He only did what he was supposed to do. He didn't do anything great. It's kind of like when my employees show up on time, I don't run outside and say, thank you, thank you, thank you. You're on time today. No, I expect them to be on time. That's part of the job. When Debbie pays our Verizon bill on time, we don't expect the president of Verizon to call us up and say, thank you, I'm so indebted to you, you paid your bill on time this month. No, I mean, they expect it. That's part of having a bill, right? And part of being a Christian is to do what Jesus says. There's nothing praiseworthy <laughs> about doing what you're commanded. All you're doing is doing your duty. You see that? You're just doing your duty. And in fact, everything good that we do in the Christian life, the Bible says that we have to trace that back to the grace of God. Did you know that? That you've never done anything good without God's assistance in your whole life? Paul says that there is nothing good in my flesh. Nothing. And he says in Philippians 2.13, It is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. So if you've ever wanted to do God's pleasure, or actually done God's pleasure, it's because God was at work in you to accomplish that. 1 Corinthians 4.7, Paul says, What do you have that you've not received? And if you've received it, why do you go around boasting as if you had not received it? In other words, any, any good thing that you've got going on in your life is received from your Heavenly Father. And so if you're able to do good works, if you're able to love people, serve the poor, manifest joy, manifest compassion towards people, witness for Christ, share your faith, all of these things, love your husband, love your wife, love your children, all of those things come because the Holy Spirit is enabling you to do those things and to glorify your Father. So at the end of our life, hey, we don't deserve special thanks or special praise, but somebody else does. God deserves it because He's enabled it. In fact, when we get to heaven, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 4, in the midst of all this glorious praise, what are the 24 elders, probably representative of the church, of us, what, are we gonna, what do they do up in heaven? Take off their crowns as meaning the rewards of their righteous deeds. They take them off and they cast them at the feet of the throne and they say, worthy are you, not me, Worthy are you to receive the glory and the honor and praise. Because we're going to feel unworthy even in heaven to have received these crowns because we know God has assisted us in any good thing that we've done. So folks, let's just draw this to a conclusion this morning and think about pride for a minute. Pride is insidious and it's a subtle enemy of every person. We're all naturally proud people. Do you know that about yourself? That pride lurks in that heart and you've got to fight it all the time. We think too highly of ourselves. That's why Paul says in Romans 12, do not think more highly of yourself than you ought to think because we all have the tendency to puff ourselves up and self-conceited and think of ourselves more highly than we should. That's why when we get into an argument, we usually think we're right and the other person's wrong. Now, why is it that we're always the ones that are right and the other person's always the one that's wrong? Well, it's probably because of our pride, wouldn't you say? And we can even be proud of our humility. Isn't that a good one? We can be pride or prideful that we're so humble. So how do we fight pride? How do we become humble disciples of Jesus? Well, number one, we need to remember that we're slaves of Christ. We're not high and mighty people with all these rights. You know, today, it's very frustrating as an employer to try to find young people that don't have a spirit of entitlement. I don't know if you guys see that all the time. I see it all the time. 
Entitlement. They're entitled to this. They're entitled to that. You can't transfer that spirit of the age over into your Christian life because the Christian life doesn't work that way. We're not entitled to anything except to serve Jesus and do His will. We need to remember that we are unworthy. Every good work that we've ever done is an imperfect work. Isn't that humbling to know that you've never done a single good thing that hasn't been at least tainted in some degree by your own flesh, by your own sinful heart, your own selfishness? Our motives get to... And sometimes it's even hard to understand your own motives, but if you can, if you can look inside and see what really drove you to do that good thing, sometimes you see, well, that wasn't a very good motive, was it? I was doing it so that person would notice me, or so they would like me, or so they would approve of me. So we confess we're slaves, we confess we're unworthy slaves, and we confess that we don't deserve special thanks or special praise. So this morning, instead of demanding that God give me some kind of thanks or some kind of special award or <laughs> some kind of special notice or praise, let's, let's thank and praise Him because He is worthy. We're unworthy slaves. He's a worthy creator, a worthy redeemer that has purchased us by His blood. By His death and resurrection, He's made us His slaves. He has done that so that we would no longer live for ourselves, but live for Him who died and rose again on our behalf. So let's exalt Him. Amen? Father, we come to You today and we want to exalt You as Your people. We recognize, Lord, that we are not worthy of special accolades. But what is mind-blowing to us is that one day in heaven, according to your word in Luke chapter 12, you're going to come up and serve us. And I'm sure we're going to feel completely out of place when you're doing that. It's us that should be serving you. But Lord, we thank you that you have set the example of humility that you did nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, you regarded others as more important than yourself. And now you've called us to walk in your footsteps. Lord, help us to honor and pray, glorify you by the kind of life we live. Keep us from an arrogant, prideful, boasting kind of spirit. Lord, let us be just humble disciples, happy to give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.